Amen. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Jay. Thank you not only for the hymn, but thank you also for, for preparing us with music and everything like that. I, I, I need to look over at outside. Is it Does it look like rain outside? Little wipers, okay, okay. Well, so we're not quite in Noah conditions yet. We're no need to start worrying that animals are going to start pairing up or anything like that. Um, yeah, I, it's sort of ironic. I, um, we um, we were up at Canyon Lake last week, and and uh, it had been you know, Sierra. Here I am starting this discussion of Noah, and and uh, it had there had not been measurable rain at Canyon Lake for 40 days at that point. So I guess it's now at 47. Um, Noah, you know, it's, it's bad when you're reading the story of Noah and you're thinking, lucky. Um, that's, <laughs> you know, but he didn't have to find a boat ramp that was actually open. Um, but anyway, no, sorry. Don't mean to be joking about that. It's a pretty stunning story when you get into it. Um, but uh, but I wanted to sing that hymn this morning because, again, this is all about God taking care of us. And, you know, no matter what the storm, no matter what the situation, to be in that ark of His protection. Um, but this morning, I wanted to open us up with a word of prayer. And again, I'm, I'm going to use a prayer from this wonderful book of Puritan prayers. I've been reading this for our, uh, for our Wednesday night class about the history of the Reformation. This is a, a prayer called Living by Prayer. And again, please excuse the uh, the uh, the archaic language, but um, but I think that it is uh, it's beautifully written, and I you know just something about praying with these and thou's and thighs that makes it feel like like you're like you're really praying sometimes. Um, but again, this this prayer is called living by prayer, which I'm sure that Noah and his family were doing. O God of the open ear, teach me to live by prayer as well as by providence for myself, soul, body, children family, church. Give me a heart frameable to thy will, so might I live in prayer and honor thee, being kept from evil known and unknown. Help me to see the sin that accompanies all I do, and the good I can distill from everything. Let me know that the work of prayer is to bring my will to thine, and that without this it is folly to pray. When I try to bring thy will to mine, it is to command Christ to be above him and wiser than he. This is my sin of pride. I can only succeed when I pray according to thy precept and promise, and to be done with it as, as it pleases thee, according to thy sovereign will. When thou commandest me to pray for pardon, peace, brokenness, it is because thou wilt give me the thing promised for thy glory, as well for my good. Help me not only to desire small things, but with holy boldness to desire great things for thy people, for myself, that, thy, that they and I might live to show thy glory. Teach me that it is wisdom for me to pray for all I have, out of love, willingly, and not of necessity, that I may come to thee at any time to lay open my needs acceptably to thee, that my great sin lies in my not keeping the savor of thy ways, that the remembrance of this truth is one way to the sense of thy presence, that there is no wrath like the wrath of being governed by my own lusts and for my own ends. O God, teach me to live by prayer, not only that I may serve you, but that I may love you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Well, again, it's great to, to be together and to know that we are held in the palm of God's hand every day and in every way. Um, there are certain events in our lives that we remember. Blessed events, wonderful events, weddings, um, births of children, graduations, things like that. But there are certain collective events, there are certain events that we remember collectively, that is, as a group, as a people, as a country, whatever, that just just stick out in that mind and have what I call that where were you when quality. Um, the most recent of those for me is, is of course, 9-11. Where were you when you heard that the Twin Towers had been attacked or had fallen? For you know, people of my parents' generation and others, there was the, the, the question of where were you when you heard that Kennedy had been assassinated? Um, I remember as a high schooler, um, where were you when you heard that the Challenger exploded? That was the first of the great 
tragedies of the uh, of the um, of the space shuttle program. I remember I was in high school and I was walking down the uh, breezeway between uh, between the gym and the library, and uh, and our principal stopped me and another kid and asked if we had heard. And of course, we hadn't because we weren't allowed to have radios or anything in school. But um, but we hadn't heard any of that. So you know, but what are some other where were you when moments that maybe we share together? Anybody got any others? December seventh, yeah, the, the Pearl Harbor, absolutely. Um, I was not here yet, um, so I was. Where was I? I was not. Um, so, so, what, uh, Ron, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Okay, yeah, yeah. How about others? Any others? Where were you? Huh? Well, nine eleven for sure, absolutely. The twin towers coming down. Um, any more mem- like happy? Where were you when events? Yeah, Kathy. They, oh, well, they, they let you out of school because World War II was over. That's a good one. That's a good one. Yeah. Yeah, so I guess VE Day or VJ Day. What, yeah, which, yeah those, are, those are some good ones. Um, well, have you, ever known, have you ever been around somebody and you, you bring up an event that you thought everybody would, would recognize, and yet, and then, but then people are like, well, what, what are you talking about? You know, what do you, or maybe it's a tragedy, maybe it's a celebration. Um, you know, it's like, it's kind of like last week. I was like, I was like, I could not believe it. You know, it's, I, I felt a really mixed, you know, conflicted, you know, piece of, or, or uh, feeling about this because on the one hand, my, my daughter went to the University of Oklahoma and, and I'm a big OU fan, uh, you know, for part of the day on Saturday. I'm also, because my son's at Texas, I'm a big Texas fan on another part of Saturdays. Um, so, you know, it's kind of up down on that day. But, well, the, this past uh, yeah, this yeah, sorry, yeah. this past Saturday, it was really tough because on the one hand, it's like I was my heart was broken for for the University of Oklahoma, which some of y'all may be feeling that, some of you not. I'm feeling that Bill's not so sad about that, but but that was also a day that I was really excited for my South Carolina Gamecocks because they never win big games like that, so that was really exciting. So that was really, good. and then you know, and then. You know, not on, you know, Texas lost, and especially the fact that they lost to Georgia. That hurt, you know, because having, because they're again a traditional rivalry, and that, that's that's tough because every citizen of the state of Georgia believes they have a right to be a Georgia Bulldog fan, and they, uh, yeah, they're just a special breed of people. Um, <laughs> anyway, but but you know, but but it's funny you talk to you, you talk to people about something like that, and people have different perceptions about about some of these things. Yes, it was a tragedy. Yes, it's a celebration. Yes, it was a big deal. No, it was not a big deal. You know, it, it, for example, it really does. Uh, it, it sort of amazed me as my as you know as I was um, uh, as I was you know teaching and preaching you know with around especially when my kids were growing up. You know, there were times when I would go and I would teach high. There, I would teach this class at the local high school about character and things like that. And of course, when I started doing that, you know, I did it for about eight years. I did it for about a month for eight years. And when I started doing that, I could use I could always use 9/11 as an example of something that we all remembered as a tragic day. It's interesting that by eight years later, by the time I finished that class, the kids who were there didn't have any memory of 9/11. And it was it was completely out of their sort of experience box, and and that really started making me think about something. It's like you know, you've got you know every generation has its has its where were you when moments, but then as we get farther away from them, they you know then we start to discover that they're not that they don't have the sting or the power or the intensity that they once had. It's not just about time either. It's like we may talk about something. Awful, horrible, the, you know, the devastation of Hurricane Harvey on Houston. But people in, you know, people in Europe don't necessarily think about it the same way. They were not involved in it. It was not as big a deal for them. Doesn't mean that when you bring them up to speed that they aren't brokenhearted about it. But, you know, you may have gone through something personal, something in your life that was a tragedy. And sometimes it hurts when other people don't recognize or take it seriously. And, and, and yet we all have these sort of cataclysmic or catastrophic moments in our lives. And, and yet sometimes we lose touch with them because they're too remote, either from us now or too remote from other people. Well, I sometimes think that the reason that we, that we do kind of treat Noah's Ark as a children's story 
is because it happened so long ago in a place so far away to people that we only know about through this story. But if we can, if we can ever take ourselves back into that story and remember that event for the cataclysm that it was, we will understand a little bit more and we can empathize a little bit more, even, I think, with the people that we connect with every day. Because one of the things I think that happens so often when we read the Bible, we read it for theology, we read it for doctrine, we read it for maybe history, we read it for some people for fact or debating points, or some people read it for leverage. But so often we miss out when we don't read the Bible with empathy. What would it have been like to have been there? What would it have been like to have been, say for example, in the ark? Or outside of the ark, or to be in the ark and know people outside of the ark. I mean, because what did we say last week? Last week we, were, we heard the people of the world had become absolutely awful, okay? But those might have been the only friends you had. I mean, do, do we all have friends that we, at some point we say, oh yeah, that guy's awful, but God love him, bless his heart. I'm not going to name names. I'm sure people said it about me. But, you know, there are people who, you know, and not, not that we judge. I mean, God didn't, I mean, Noah did not choose who was going to be in the ark. Noah's family didn't choose who was going to be in the ark. But there were still people inside the ark and there were people outside the ark. And no matter how bad they felt about those people, that's got to weigh on you. And then to get off the ark later and realize there's nobody else who's going to get that. Because it's not like anybody else on the other side of the world heard about this, this horrible flood and is there to talk about it with you. All you've got are the people with you. I mean, again, I think we need to, we need to invest in a little bit of empathy Whenever we read these stories, especially the ones that have been reduced to cartoons or have been reduced to, um, you know, flannel graph presentations or Sunday school lessons, we need to, if we're going to be mature believers, we need to actually try and really understand how God is speaking to us through these events. Because Genesis 7 talks about the story of the flood, focusing on God's command to Noah, the obedience of Noah, and the beginning of God's judgment on earth through the floodwaters. And this chapter emphasizes themes of judgment, salvation, obedience, and divine sovereignty. Now, this is, this is, a, this is really what I would call an event chapter. It's talking about what happened. So we're going to go through the events of chapter 7 as we discuss the ark. So beginning of chapter 7, verse 1. Then the Lord said to Noah, Go into the ark, you and all your household, for I have seen that, you're, that you are righteous before me in this generation. Take with you seven pairs of all clean animals, the male and his mate, and a pair of the animals that are not clean, the male and his mate, and seven pairs of the birds of the heavens also, male and female, to keep their offspring alive on, on the face of all the earth. For in seven days I will send rain on the earth, uh, on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. And everything, every living thing that I have made, I will blot out from the face of the ground. And Noah did all that the Lord had commanded him. Again, this is an important sentence. And Noah did all that the Lord had commanded him. If we are thinking, caring, loving people, we can't just look at the verbs of this sentence all by themselves. Noah did all that the Lord had commanded him. God said, you go into the ark, you and all your household, for I've seen that you're righteous before me in this generation. I mean, those, those are two sentences that frame up you know, a, a, pretty important, uh, a pretty important promise of God and, and Noah's response. But again, what does that not tell us? It tells us what happened. It tells us what Noah did. What does it not tell us? It doesn't tell us what's going in, on inside Noah. It doesn't tell us the temptations that Noah may have faced. For example, you know, think about this. You know, go into the ark, and then seven days later, that's when he's going to shut up the ark. Noah did all that the Lord commanded him. What's he thinking for seven days? Are there any other righteous people? Maybe the Lord made a mistake. 
Maybe somebody, may, do I deserve to be here? Anybody here ever have imposter syndrome? Do I deserve this? Do I deserve to be here? I mean, this is a, I mean, this is a, again, unless these are just characters and caricatures, these are real people. And, and remember, everybody out there is everyone I know. I remember I was, uh, there was a movie came out a few years ago where, you know, <laughs> where it's a science fiction movie, but it was a really funny line. I just love it. It's a, the guy says that, so it's a science fiction movie and these, these characters are trying to decide whether or not they're going to save the universe or not. It's called Guardians of the Galaxy. And the whole, the, the whole point is like, you know, well, we're going to see, it's like, he says, we've got to say, we got to do this or else the universe is going to be destroyed. We're the only ones who can save the universe. And the other character says, well, why do you want to save the universe? What's the universe ever done for you? <laughs> and the first character says, well, the, none, it hadn't done anything for me, but that's where all my stuff is. Um, <laughs> it's like, you know, it's like, I want to save the universe because that's where all my stuff is. And it's like, I, you know, it's like, they might not be great people, but they're the only people we know, <laughs> you know. But I mean, but again, just I, I shouldn't belabor this too much. But but again, we're, we need to consider this from that point. So so God has commanded Noah to enter the ark with his family, um, affirming that Noah is righteous in his eyes. One of the things we need to point out: this is something that came up last night in a Bible study, or last night in our class. Righteous does not necessarily equal sinless. You know, there's none who's sinless. We know that, you know, for no one is sinless. We all fall short of the glory of God. Righteous, however, means that we are made right with God. We know through Jesus Christ, in this case, through obedience. But it doesn't mean that Noah was perfect. And do and you think that he ever, you know, did anything out of jealousy or anger or, you know, selfishness? Or you think he ever had a spat with Mrs. Noah or anything like that? And he ever felt any regret over that? Yeah. He's probably wondering, he's probably like, I hope, I hope God closes this door before he really checks my resume. But in any event, he's been told he's been made this promise by God. Um, and, you know, and, but it ought to give us a question, give us pause. What does it mean to be righteous in God's sight? What does it mean to be righteous in God's sight? Um, so Noah's told to bring seven pairs of clean animals and one pair of unclean animal. Uh, include ensuring that the preservation of life will take place after the flood. Now, I think it's interesting that the emphasis on clean animals likely pertains to their role in both food and in worship. It's not just about staying alive. It's also about what? They're thinking ahead. God's thinking ahead to worship after the ark, after the deluge, after all of this has happened. He wants to show us that, that Noah is not supposed to leave religion behind. That's not part of the old world. There is still, this is still a covenant God, and that is still the most, uh, that is still the most important relationship in the world. Now, I think it's interesting. We didn't really talk about this, but you know, religion, if you think about this, religion, prayer, worship, in, in Noah's context, is a relatively recent invention. If you remember, I mean, it's, it says that, you know, that the sons of Seth, you know, they, they, they finally prayed. This, you know, it was, you know, the prayer was not a, an everyday thing because it was more like I mean, maybe what we would call prayer, you know, conversation with God existed. But the idea of formalized religious prayer was not an everyday thing until, you know, until hundreds of years after the garden. You know, we see that with the, the children of Seth and things like that. But, but in any case, given the context, it's still a pretty recent a recent idea, at least for Noah and his family. But God is already projecting that worship is going to be important. And we see that, we'll see that especially next week as they get off the ark. But in verse four, God gives this seven day warning before the flood's arrival, demonstrating that why, that his judgment, while inevitable, is preceded by some time, a period of grace, perhaps. Some people say that that was a time for people to repent. I, I don't know, you know, I don't know if I believe that or not. It seems that God's already made his decision, but but the point is is that Noah's complete obedience to God's commands is is what's emphasized. You know, there's always the debate, and interestingly, the story appears in the Quran that Noah during these during these days before the ark came, he was actually preaching to people, trying to convince them to come onto the ark. And so so the so the devastation of humanity was actually could actually be faulted to our stubbornness to, you know, human stubbornness, refusing to get on the ark. And what people like to do is make the analogy that that's really about, you know, us accepting God or whatever. But, 
the Bible doesn't actually give us that perspective. The Bible says, you know, you've got seven, seven days to load the ark, which I would think if you're loading that many animals and that much stuff, it's going to take a minute. Okay, so, so and that may feel rushed. I, mean, I don't know about y'all, but like Morgan and I started preparing for a trip like two weeks ahead. Some of y'all are probably like the carry-on only type of people. He's like, you're like throwing like three things in your, in your suitcase and you're done for the day. You know, we're, we're not, we, we think, we plan, I make lists. It's, I, 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 I would want to be faithful to the Lord here, but, but seven days would not have been enough. <laughs> you know, it's like, I would, yeah, it's like, you know, and can you imagine being on the ark for like, you know, five months without a toothbrush or something? That, that would have been me. I mean, like, I thought you got it. No, no. Um, Sorry, this is like, this is not group therapy. This is Bible study. This is not marriage counseling. Um, but anyway, you know the the point of verses, you know, the, of these first few verses is that righteousness before God is that you know is is honored by God. It is part of of what He's looking for. He's not you know notice that He doesn't He doesn't select Noah because he's the most fit, because he's the most because he's the tallest because he's the smartest, because he's the most wealthy. These are not the things that matter to God. What matters to God? Character matters to God. Faithfulness matters to God. This is what God honors. This is what God preserves. So what does it mean to be righteous in God's eyes? How do we respond to that idea? So again, verses 2 and 3 instructs Noah to take seven pairs of, of all these animals. Um, you know, there's there's pairs of every species of animals. I love it how last week he's, you all said at the Ark Experience they told you that 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 they were all young animals. I guess like so so baby elephants, which I love that. I, mean, I was thinking about that all week last week. I was like, or all, since last week, I was like, I was like, oh, that's such a good. That, that's so smart. God is so brilliant. You don't send a full size elephant on the Ark. You send a travel size elephant <laughs> on the elephant. You know, you know how you go down, you go to CVS before a big trip or Walgreens and you go to the little samples aisle and you choose, you choose the toothpaste that you never use other times, but because it comes in the small bag. I mean, it's like, so a travel size elephant, a travel size giraffe, you know, I mean, I, I, I love that. I, I think, I mean, I think that's awesome, but it's, but again, it makes sense. You could actually fit, you know, you, you don't have to worry about, you don't have to worry about all that space when you have that kind of, when you've got that kind of provision. That's right. A smaller exhaust, small. Yeah, yeah. It's it's better on the front end and the back end of that proposition. Um, the pairs of every species of animals. Three pairs were to be taken, whether beasts or birds. And the reason was that that uh, you know, rapid multiplication was possibly a matter of the highest importance. They wanted to make sure that when they got out of the ark, God wanted to make sure that the the earth did repopulate well. But why? You know why? You know why seven pairs? Well, one of the things is that it's been. It's you know that it was manifestly reserved for sacrifice. Again, you had that seventh you know that that seventh pair was possibly for that you know for that ritualistic for that that holy purpose. Um, again, you know there's a lot of complexity, and we can you know we can sort of break down a lot of these details for a long time. But I, I think it's I think it's worth it for us to consider some of these things. Um, next next question. Um, yeah, that's it. Okay, sorry. Now Noah was six hundred years old when the flood waters came upon the earth, and Noah and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him went into the ark to escape the waters of the flood of clean animals and of the animals that are not clean and of birds and of everything that creeps on the ground. Two and two, male and female, went into the ark with Noah as God had commanded Noah. And after seven days, the water, uh, and after seven days, the waters of the flood came upon the earth. So again, here's, you know, Noah and finally Noah and his family come in. Again, 600 years old when the floodwaters came. Do you get to a certain point in your life you think, well, I mean, I know, I mean, I'm guilty of this. I'm, I'll be 56 next month. Um, and, um, and, and yeah, I've gotten to a point in my life where I, where I am foolish enough to believe, well, we've hit cruising altitude. <laughs> Things are not going to change from here. I've got it. Pre I've got everything pretty much set up. And my, you know, the plans I've made clearly God has endorsed, right? Have you ever wondered, you know, how hard la God laughs at our plans because He changes things? Now, I'll be 56, 
Noah was 600 years old. You think he'd gotten into a groove? <laughs> I, heard a, I, I heard this old fellow yesterday, uh, the other day. I was watching this YouTube video, this old rancher up in Wyoming. He says, he says, he says, you know what it means to be in a rut? A rut is just a grave with the ends knocked out. As, <laughs> I thought, ooh, <laughs> that's harsh. For 600 years, though, humanity, or at least during Noah's lifetime, had been in a rut. Had been in a rut of sin. Had been in a rut of disobedience. Had been in a rut of absolute catastrophic evil. Every idea in their hearts was always only turned to evil. Remember that verse from last week? For 600 years, Noah and his family had endured this. Now, I want, to, I want us again to think about that. What does it mean to have endured that kind of evil, evil so great that God said He was going to wipe out the human race, what does it mean to have to endure that for that long? And when we have, we have psalms that were written after only 50 years of, of exile in Babylon saying, How long, O Lord? And this is, this is you know, 600 years, not just 50 years. How long, O oh Lord, are you going to allow your people to suffer? How long, O oh Lord, must we cry out to you? How long, O oh Lord, before you send your Messiah? How long before you give us some relief? I mean, think about whatever, whatever people group it is. And how long, Lord, or how many times are we going to have to suffer from this hurricane? How long are we going to be persecuted? But now, he has his answer. He has his answer. And Noah and his family are taken into the ark. Um, just uh, a couple points on this. Verses 11. And 12, verses 11, uh, excuse me, uh, verse 600 in the Noah's life, and all the fountains of the great deep burst forth, and the windows of the heavens were opened, and rain fell upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. And on the very same day, Noah and his son, Shem and Ham and Japheth, and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons with them entered the ark. They and every beast according to its kind, and all the livestock according to their kinds, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth according to its kind, and every bird according to its kind, every winged creature. They went into the ark with Noah, two and, a, uh, two, and two of all flesh in which there was the breath of life. And those that entered, male and female of all flesh, went in as God commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. Now, that's a very complicated sentence. Let's start at verse 14. They and every beast according to its kind, according to its kind, according to its kind, according to its kind, and they entered male and female, went in as God had commanded them. What does that tell you? This is a God of organization. <laughs> Everybody is careful. This was not just a mass rush for the ark. This God had this ordered. God was in control. God's providence was moving people, let's keep not moving people, moving animals. The animals are people too. Um, you know, they were moving them all to the ark in a very specified way. Now we don't know, you know, what the order was. Was it alphabetical order? Was it, you know, was it you know, by height? Was it by, you know, type? Was it by section they were going to be in? I, we don't know. I mean, did they, did the lions pay more for a nicer cabin? I mean, you know, we don't know. But we do know that it's organized. And we do know that God has an order. And you see that, you know, when, when's another time when you heard about things being made or be, things being, you know, brought to be according to their own, own kind. When do we hear that? In creation. There's a little bit of a sense here that God is setting up a new creation. He's not completely doing away with creation, but there is definitely that sense of a kind of a reboot. Now, consider this. What, do, you know, what, and we talked about this when we talked about creation. What is the image, if you, <clears throat> if you had to describe the words tohu vavohu, that's the, the, the words formless and void that are used at the beginning, as in, in the beginning, the world, earth was formless and void, the world, universe was formless and void. What is the, he, in the Hebrew mind, when they hear the words tohu vavohu, the chaos before creation, what do they picture? Yeah, Janet, you got it. The sea. Yeah, I love it. The person from Midland named the sea. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Because what's scarier to a nomadic hill people than the sea? 
I mean, if you're used to building your house on the rock as opposed to the slippery sand, if you're used to you know, being in the mountains where you're usually safe from hurricanes and things like that, what then terrifies you more than anything, especially after it's happened in Western North Carolina? It's a place where you think you're safe. It's the chaos of the storm, the chaos of the tohu vavohu once again. And so you've got, again, you've got this, I'm not saying, it's not a formula, it's like, not like, ha ha, these, these things connect, but it's, there is a, there's a kind of an idea that, as Mark Twain says, history doesn't always repeat itself, but it does rhyme. And so what you've got is in the, cre- you've almost got sort of a, a setting up metaphorically and, and in a literary way, a, re, a reinterpretation or a reenactment of the creation itself. So you've got the you've got the tohu vavohu, the the crashing waves and the sea and everything like that, and then and in the midst of it will be that which is everything in order, just as God prescribes it. How? By His command. Did God send angels down to be animal wranglers? No. How did they get into the ark? On their own power, by His command. You didn't have Noah and his sons whipping them in. You didn't have anybody riding them. You didn't have, I mean, you didn't have a bell cow or anything like that. You just had God's word instructing them to go in. God spoke creation the first time. God spoke preservation in this instance. Everything is by his command. At any point, he could have come down and just, you know, he could have just built the ark, you know, said, ha, look at that, an ark. But instead, what did he do? He commanded know what to do it by his word by his command this is all happening according to his command um, one last piece to look at in this um, no uh, in verse 11 in the 600th year of Noah's life in the second month on the 17th day of the month very specific I don't know did anybody did they give y'all a date for that did they say what the date of that was okay sometimes they do sometimes sometimes people be like okay we figured out that this is a Tuesday and um, um, actually because yesterday, Yesterday, according to Bishop Usher's calculations from Genesis, I think yesterday or yeah, I think it's yesterday is like the, the it is the anniversary of the creation of the earth, according to the according to Bishop Usher's interpretation of Genesis. So, just happy Earth Day. <laughs> that doesn't feel right. Happy Creation Day. Um, uh, but anyway, in the 600th year, all this and rain. Uh, excuse me. Uh, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep for, burst forth and the windows of the heavens were opened. Which begs the question, is this the first time it's ever rained? If you look in Scripture up to this point, there is no record of rain. How is the earth watered? If you, if you, look, at the, if you look at Genesis chapter 2, where does it come from? It comes from, yeah, it's sprinklers. <laughs> yeah, there was a, there, you know, God set up a sprinkler system somehow. But remember in creation, how is creation described? How's the, you know, it's, there is a separation of what? The earth, the waters below, and the waters above. And, and the waters above are contained behind this, this dome called the rakia, or we, in King James English, what do we call it? The firmament. Or we might call it what? The sky. So the whole idea is, is that you have, you know, you've not had rain up to this point. And what happens now? All of a sudden, that dome cracks. And water just comes dumping in. It's like, yes, it's raining, but like the kind of rain that, we've, that you've never seen before. And literally, they've never seen before. It's also coming from the ground. It's bursting forth from the ground. So you're getting it from both directions. I mean, the absolute calamity of that. I mean, we might think of that, we, we might be able to envision that in terms of something like a volcano eruption, something like fire burning up through the earth. But the whole idea of, of water just bursting up from the, from the earth, chaos ripping the world apart. And the tohu vavohu finally let loose in the world. And chaos, it seems to be absolutely taking over. So again, this, this whole issue you know, the, of the earth, you know, the, the sky breaking open and the earth bursting forth, 
Interesting thing, though, the whole idea that the sky is breaking open for the absolute destruction of humanity. When's another time in Scripture when the sky broke open? Well, before he died, when Jesus was baptized. When Jesus was baptized, it says, uh, you know, Matthew, they say that, that the sky split. The word schism, split. But this time when the sky split, what happened? Did water come down and destroy the earth? No. The Holy Spirit came down and said, This is my, my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. I mean, in the future, when God rips open the sky, is to pour out His Holy Spirit. This time, something much more devastating. So, the flooding continues. The, it's, it's actually sort of not enough to say it just rained for 40 days and 40 nights. The geysers and the, and the, and the absolute um, uh, dumping of water took place for 40 days and 40 nights. And then floodwaters covered everything for 150 days. So the whole idea there is that for 150 days, it was just static. Just static. Now, why is that important? Um, most scholars believe that the reason that God, you know, made sure that it was, you know, that, that, that the floodwaters remained for 150 days was to ensure absolute devastation. You know, it's, you know, you might be able to hang on to a branch or a log or something like that for a week, two weeks. Nobody, I mean, nothing could survive this. The elimination of the human species and everything that was outside of the ark was 100% destroyed. And that's, you know, it is, it is to ensure the thoroughness. What is 150 days? Approximately five months. So the comprehensive nature of the flood is really what's being enforced here. That it was, it was total destruction. Because then, finally, after that 150 days, then the floodwaters begin to recede. And then in verses 13 through 16, um, you know, we have the loading of the ark and everything like that. Um, it is uh, it is interesting too. This last verse, uh, the last verse, sixteen. And those that entered, male and female, uh, female of all flesh, went in as God had commanded them, and the Lord shut him in. Now, I think I think it could be Lord shut them in, but he's but the, the scripture is specifying the Lord shut Noah in. Um, this is you know. This is a again a very powerful idea, you know, the door closing behind him. Um, on the one hand, for those inside, a great relief; for those outside, a great terror. And if we look to other depictions of judgment, say for example in the book of Revelation, we see that the day of judgment for those who are in Christ, who are in the Lord's protection will be a day of great joy and will be a day of great salvation. For those who are outside, it will be a day of great terror. And beloved, I, I, don't, I am not a fire and brimstone preacher. I don't like fire and brimstone preaching. But one of the things that I and others are compelled to do is to preach the whole counsel of God, which is that there is nothing neutral about judgment. There is nothing neutral. There is nothing casual about judgment. When that door is shut, you want to be on the inside. Okay. Now, remember, look at how God has done this. God is moving people inside. God is moving the animals inside. I mean, His grace is all over this. But there is the understanding that if you're not on the inside, you're on the outside. And that doesn't mean... A the church. Please don't ever believe that that means that the doors of the church are shut. The doors of the church are flung wide open so that all those that God is calling to him may come in. But there will come a time when Christ returns and those doors are shut. And we need to be prepared for that. And the only way to be prepared for that is to make sure that we're in the ark. And if God has invited us into the ark and we've heard that call, guess what? He's calling you in the ark. So that is just something that we need to we need to be very clear about, even from Genesis to Revelation. 
Um, but I do, you know, I, I think it's important that we we remember though that this whole story is mainly a story about God's grace more than His judgment, because though uh, though Noah was righteous, it does not say that he was sinless. It does not say that he was perfect. God does not save perfect people; otherwise, He would ha- not have to save anybody. But He does save Noah and his family in spite of their imperfections. And so we see grace there. It's not, a, you know, it's. I think so often we, we believe that it's such a tragedy that God, you know, that you know that that God, or it's so cruel that God would let all these people, you know, that you know die an eternal death. It's like, well, no, actually, it's a miracle that He saves any of us, given what we deserve. And so, you know, we, we want to keep all of these things in mind as we as we read this story. Um, but we do. But but uh, as Noah's as the door is shut behind Noah, we see that not just we we see that yes as a metaphor of God's judgment, but also a metaphor of God's um, uh, of God's protection. Now, when I, when I say a metaphor, I mean it, he really did shut the door. It really wasn't art. There really was a door. But how do we interpret that? Um, last section. Oops. The flood continued 40 days on the earth, and the waters increased and bore up the ark, and it rose high above the earth. The waters prevailed and increased greatly on the earth, and the earth flo- and the ark floated on the face of the waters. And the waters prevailed so mightily on the earth that all the high mountains under the whole, uh, under the whole heaven were covered. Now, this is one of those controversial passages in the book of Genesis that has both Christians... Well, I would say that it has Christians and non-Christians. It has has Christians of different types debating and scratching their heads, but it also has um, it also has people outside of Christianity saying, "Well, clearly, you know, this is you know this is a uh, this is a fairy tale." Because let's read the implications of it. The flood continued for forty days on the earth. Remember, we're not just talking about a gentle rain; we're talking about all all water breaking loose. The waters increased and bore the ark, and it rose high above the earth. The waters prevailed and increased greatly on the earth, and the ark floated above the face of the waters. And the waters prevailed so mightily on, on the earth that all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered. So, how you know which mountains stayed above the waterline, according to this passage? Not even like, not even the Chisos Mountains at the Big Bend. Not even Mount Mitchell in the Appalachians? Not even Mount Everest? No. According to that sentence, it was all underwater. Okay? Now, it's interesting that, you know, there are other other versions of the flood story that come from, say, for example, the the Egg of Gilgamesh from uh, from, uh, Babylonian uh, literature and some others, like other Sumerian and other myths uh, that, that talk about the flood as more of a localized endeavor, um, meaning that it did not cover the whole earth, but just kind of the empire, the kingdom, everything that they knew, all civilization. Um, that's become sort of a, a popular point of deba- debate among um, even Christian scholars. It's like, did you know? Did the earth? Did the whole earth get covered, or was it just sufficient? To cover, you know, to, to wipe out humanity as far as humanity had spread, and and I mean, the, the argument is that okay, humanity hadn't spread that far. The flood would only have east or the or or Mesopotamia, that land between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers and the banks on either side. So there's the theory that you know the flood itself was more localized. And the reason that people argue against it is because, well, but, you know, you know, a catastrophic worldwide flood would have reshaped the earth, would have, would have changed the surface of, of, the enti- of every landmass, every mountain range, every ocean bed, everything. That, 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 you know, a worldwide deluge, deluge described like this would literally change the face of the earth. Here's my question. What did the face of the earth look like before the flood? Does anybody know? Now, we only know the world, what? After the flood. I don't, I've never seen any pictures of the world before the flood. So is it possible that what we're seeing now is all post-flood? 
Does you know does the flood you know does the earth you know was it created or was it you know does it exist or or present itself geologically in layers? Yeah, kind of like you know a floodplain does. Um, does it you know is it possible that you know that you know glacial deposits and things like that these huge huge water areas of water that froze possible residual floodwaters? I don't know. The point is, you know, the Bible is not a book of science in, in the sense that my son's, you know, my son's earth history textbook was. But um, there is, you know, there is both significant, you know, anthropological and, uh, and geological evidence to suggest that, you know, the idea of a worldwide catastrophic water event is not, is not crazy. Yeah. I, well, all the people except for the ones in the ark, and I, everybody else was dead. Why you don't decorate your children's nursery and the, and the Noah's Ark theme? <laughs> um, because you know it's like you know don't want little stick figures floating in the water. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> so Kelly, I'm going to get a little bit weird here for a second. Uh, so I say, y'all are like, y'all, that, that ship has sailed. That ark has floated, Bob. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's like, well, what? You know, obviously, what did they not bring into the ark? You know, sea creatures, the stuff, you know, the fish. And the, I mean, where'd the bodies go? They went down to the bottom. They went, you know, they went down or they got picked up by somebody on the way down to the bottom. I mean, yeah, they, I mean, that's, yeah, I mean, that's not what you bring into the third third grade Sunday school class, but 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 yes, it's it's, it's kind of like it's. There are some distasteful facts in the Bible. Where did Wayne? Where did wait, Wayne? Where did Cain's wife come from? Well, think about it. <laughs> Got to be his sister. You know, ooh, yeah. Don't talk about that one in your kindergarten Sunday school class. But yeah, I mean, it's it's what you know. The whole, I mean, and, and first of all, biblically speaking, there were no people beyond the ones that are described in this story. Remember, I mean, humanity was not millions and millions of people at this point. Humanity, I mean, we think we tend to think of the world population spread out in t- over the whole earth and not just localized into this one area. Either way, the whole earth is is destroyed. Now, or the whole population, human population, and. and and that and the animal population that was not contained in the ark or in the water. Uh, to God's original plan. What was God's original plan for humanity? Was it that they just all stay in the one place and build great monuments and cities to themselves? That was to go out, spread out, and multiply all over the earth. Well, there's you know if you look at at the early chapters of Genesis, it appears that they all kind of stayed in one place. They were all kind of staying in this one civilization, building up. What happens after the ark? We'll talk about this in a few weeks. You got the Tower of Babel. Again, people are not wanting to get out and spread and cover the whole earth. There's a there's a good sense here that in, in the story that everybody is still concentrated. The question becomes for a lot of people, and this is one of those debates that you hear between people who believe that well, the Bible can't be true because it doesn't align with the geological record, and that couldn't have happened. I just want you to know that people have been thinking through this, have thought about this in a lot of different contexts over the years. Is it possible? Is a worldwide flood possible? Is there any evidence for it? And the answer comes up again, yes. Um, is it conclusive evidence for everybody? Does everybody believe it? Does all Christians believe that? Not necessarily. Is it necessary to believe it was a whole a, a whole earth flood? For me, it is because I, you know, for me it become it comes down to the and to the integrity of the Bible. But then again, I can also understand that when the, you know, when the Lord is talking or when the Bible talks about these sort of universal concepts that, you know, I mean, definitely all humans had to be wiped out. Was it necessary for it to cover the whole earth for that to happen? I'm going to leave that to the Lord. I take the Billy Graham, the Billy Graham approach, which is that, you know, the Bible is the word of God, and that's as far as I have to go. I'm a theologian. I'm a pastor. I am not a biologist or a paleontologist, and I don't do, I'm not good at math. So I'm not going to go down that road. But I know people who, who do believe and who do know that stuff, and I'm happy to refer you to them. But again, this is one of those areas where, where people kind of say, oh, come on, this is just a story. This is a fairy tale. It's a myth. There's reason to believe in, in, at every level that this is true. 
Um, finally, the, the verse 24 notes that the waters remained on earth for 150 days. And this indicates, again, the seriousness of God's judgment. Um, you have, I mean, but I think it's interesting that, you know, how long, 150 days, you know, think about time-wise, you're talking about half a year. The rest of the year is what? The water's receding. So you've got God's judgment for half the year, but then it's followed by what? It's followed by His mercy. It's followed by His grace, and it's followed by those, by those steps that will eventually lead to restoration. So God's last word is not the destruction of the earth. That's the thing that's always amazing to me about when people talk about revelation. And if y'all notice, there's only one revelation. <laughs> I always like to point that out. There's, there's no book of revelations in the Bible. I will dock you points for that. Um, but in the book of Revelation, everybody thinks that the Re book of Revelation is about the end of the world. The book of Revelation is not about the end of the world. The book of Revelation is about the recreation of the world. The story of Noah is not about the end of humanity. It's about the restoration of humanity. It's about the recreation of humanity. Not a total recreation, we'll see, unfortunately. You know, this is still the fallen race of Adam. But this is the, this is the remnant, as we talked about last week, that will lead to that, to that group, that, those people who will become the plan through which God restores humanity to sinlessness. So, um, so in summary, you know, Genesis 7 reveals both God's judgment on sin Yet it also uh, points to, first of all, his provision for the righteous, and it begins to lay the groundwork for the restoration of creation. Because again, he didn't just get one of each animal, which would die out in a generation, but instead he populated with the ark with the type of, with the type of animal sampling, if you will, with which the whole earth could be restored. So, Chapter 7 is, yes, about the destruction, the judgment of God, but it's also about God's promise and proof of His providence and His restoration as well. All right. I actually fin finished a couple early uh, today. Any thoughts or any questions? All right. Well, I think I've left you a little bit of work to do in your groups, so let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we thank You so much again for today. We thank you that even when we are in those moments of great calamity, in those moments of tragedy, that, that this story reminds us that, yes, there is hope ahead. That, yes, there is restoration coming. And, yes, you are taking care of us now. And so, Lord, we just pray that whatever, whatever storm, whatever flood, whatever catastrophe um, we find ourselves in the midst of, Help us remember, O oh Lord, that you are there and that you have shut us in and that you are holding us in the palm of your hand. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you very much. Mm.